All right. Well, hey, good morning, River Rock Church. Thank you so much for joining us on Facebook Live and RiverRockChurch.net. We want to say a very special happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us uh, in this virtual setting. We so wish that you could be here with us, but we just want to bless you, and we know that the Holy Spirit is with you wherever you're at. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, church family, connect groups. We thank you so much for joining us wherever you're watching, even if you're watching out of state or another country. Thank you so much for spending part of your Sunday with us, whether it's live on the Internet now or on a repeat later. So we're going to jump into some worship, and we're going to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Amen. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of his promises evermore. And pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let me out of the desert, brought me into his streams, river of living water, turn my bitter into sweet, all my burdens are lifted, took the shackles off my feet, cause there's no sound louder than a captive set free, so let the redeemed of the Lord say so. joy in the morning. There is joy in the morning. Springing up in my soul. There's a life worth living. Cause he calls me his own. There's a hallelujah. After sweet victory. There's no sound louder than a captive set free. No, no, no. There's no sound
Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you that we are the redeemed of the Lord, that we can proclaim your glory. We can proclaim your goodness, God. So, Father, I thank you for just ministering to our brothers and sisters all over the world, all over this country, God, all over this state, all over the city, Father, wherever they're at. And, God, I thank you for your health, your protection. Father, we bless every mom out there, God, and we just thank you for just giving them wisdom and strength, God, in this season, Lord. We love you. We thank you for all the good things you're going to do today. Lord, give us hearts to receive and do your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much, River Rock. We love you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us uh, right now. We're going to come back up after the service. Once again, moms, happy Mother's Day to each one of you. And online, family, if you could please help me welcome Pastor Rick McFarlane. Mother's Day. Um, this is such a wonderful day to celebrate our moms. Uh, where would we be without them? We wouldn't be here. So praise God. So I appreciate my mom. Uh, hopefully she'll be watching from Tulsa. And so if your moms are with you right now, uh, where you're at, give lean over and give them a kiss and say, I love you. And so if they are not with you, please give them a call if they are alive. So praise God. So let's, uh, let's just, just pray for our mothers and just bless them today. And so, uh, Father, we just thank you so much for our mothers. We thank you, Father, for just what they mean to us in so many ways, Lord. And sometimes we have not been grateful as we should or expressed it like we should. So, Lord, I pray today, um, if there's communication going on, uh, uh, Lord, with, with mothers, Lord, I pray that that communication from the heart would be shown. Lord, I just thank you, Father, that that you uh, have a just a blessing up for mothers today, Lord, and I just pray that you let them know that, that they did a good job and, and they, they sowed the word of God into their kids, and, and even if their kids are strayed away, the word of God sown uh, will bring them back, that when they are old, they won't depart from it. So, Lord, if there's strained relationships between mothers and sons, mothers and daughters, or mothers and grandchildren, Lord, I pray that you'd restore relationships, Lord, and, and we thank you for doing that right now in the name of Jesus. So Lord, we bless our mothers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we, I've come out of hibernation and actually got a haircut. I feel human. Hallelujah. And so things are starting to slowly come back. Businesses are starting to open back up and can't wait for the restaurants to open up and stuff like that. So very soon that that will take place. So. Uh, and graduations are taking place, so congratulations if you are graduating any uh, level of school, if that's high school, if that is uh, college or Karis Bible College. So we just want to celebrate you, and so uh, we do want to um, have a meeting with the church, and so this Wednesday we're going to have a live Zoom meeting at 6 p.m. for those that can. And so we're going to be sending an, an, an email link out, a Zoom link for you to get on. And so we want to celebrate those that are graduating. We also want to pray for those that are going to be leaving the church and going somewhere else. And we also want to lay out a plan and, and for uh, a focus on where we're moving forward on the next phase of, of the church. So that's important things I'd like for you guys to hear. And, and so please, uh, if you are not on our email list, you don't get emails from us, then you can email us at the church website. It's riverrockchurch.net at gmail.com. Hopefully that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but it's riverrockchurch at uh, riverrockchurch.net at gmail.com. And so again, uh, if you're not on the email list, please email us. We'll get you on that list so you can be a part of that Zoom. And so we have good things to share. All righty, so you ready for the word of God. All right, let's, let's pray over our spiritual meal. And so, uh, Father, we just thank you for the word of God. And that it's already blessed and will bless us as we open our heart and receive it with, with teachableness, with meekness of heart. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, you're the divine teacher. We call upon you to teach and uh, break this word apart and minister to every individual heart. Father, anoint the eyes, ears, and hearts of your saints and open them by the gift of your grace and cause them to see, hear, and understand what you're saying. Break it apart and minister it to them exactly how they need it. We thank you that you're doing this miracle right now in the name of Jesus. Everybody say amen. All right. So we're going to actually finish chapter 2 of Romans by the grace and faith of God. And so Romans chapter 2, we're in verse 19 through verse 29. So let's read that and then we'll unpack it. Romans 2, 19 says, And, and are confident that you or yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth that's in the law, you, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For the circumcision is indeed profitable... 
if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not for men, but from God. So let's go back up to verse 19. Let's unpack this. It says, and you are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. In this chapter, Paul is speaking to the religious Jew. Chapter 1, he's speaking to the, un, to the heathen, the Gentiles. But in chapter 2, he's speaking to the, gen, to the Jew. The Jews are sitting at the Gentiles, judging the Gentiles for the list of sins Paul enumerates in chapter 1. And Paul basically puts a finger on them and says, yes, you're doing the same thing. But you're just doing it in secret. See, legalism, the people that are in legalism, they do the exact same things the heathen do that are openly professing it. They're proud of it. They're out there doing it. And a religious person, they do the very same things, but they do it secretly and hide it, and they do it in private, live a double life. And so we're going to talk about the religious person today, and we don't want, as a Christian, we can be religious or we can be a true Christian with a relationship with God and live a true faith that's not filled with hypocrisy. And so there's a lot of Christians out there that are hypocrites. They're full of hypocrisy and they live a double life. They teach and preach loudly one thing, but they don't live it on the, on the other side of it. And so none of us are perfect in our behavior, but again, we are striving to manifest Jesus in everything we're doing. So in verse 19 again, it's talking about the religious Jew. And these Jews are confident that they are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. And so look at verse 20. It says they're an instructor of the foolish. Look at that word instructor. It's the Greek word which means a trainer of children. It's a Greek word that means a trainer of children. And so legalistic people, they boast in their maturity, especially Christians that are legalistic. The most legalistic Christians say that think they're so mature and everybody else they need to teach and that they see them as babies or immature ones that need to be grown up and it was their job to raise them up. But actually a legalistic Christian is a very immature person and so again they don't know it. And so growth in Christ is a growth in grace. And so you can't really grow in the Lord Jesus Christ until you grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and his finished work and put your faith in his grace. And so, again, a religious person is an instructor of the foolish. They think everyone around them is foolish, and they're the smart ones and, and full of pride. And that's what a legalistic person is. And so pride is a disease that, that you have, and the only person that doesn't know about it is the one that has it. Everybody else realizes you're full of pride. And so, again, a legalistic person is actually fo the foolish one. And so they're an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. And so, again, this word babes is the Greek word which means unable to speak. It means, speaks of an infant that can't speak. And so they always see people around them as babies and that they're so mature and that I need to raise you up. And so, again, a legalistic Christian really is the one who's a spiritual baby. And so, again, we can only grow in grace. And it says a teacher of babes having the form of knowledge and the truth that's in the law. Look at that word form. And really, the law was just a form of knowledge. And so actually, this form was a shadow. When you have a shadow, an object casts a shadow, that's a form of the object. And so the law was a form of knowledge. It was actually a shadow. But a shadow is cast from light, source, and also an object. And we're going to find out in Colossians 2.17 that Jesus Christ is the object that cast the Old Testament shadow. Because every bull, every bullock, every lamb, the temple, the priesthood, all represented the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the law was a shadow, and Jesus was the substance. He was the real object. And so again, uh, the religious person, they worship God in the shadows. They worship the shadow instead of the real thing. And so the law is a shadow of the person of Christ. And actually, in Jesus is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And look at Colossians 2.3. Let's read that. Colossians 2.3 says, In Christ, or in him, were hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so he is the, the object of the law. And so he is the object that cast the law, the form of the law that we see was a shadow. 
And so it says, and also here, it says, having the form of knowledge and truth that's in the law. The law contained truth. The law was a codified, uh, a written form of truth. But Christ is the living truth. Matter of fact, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus called himself the truth. Jesus is the living truth. And so the law was a codified form, a written down form of truth and contained truth. Actually, in John 1.17, I love this verse. John 1.17 basically said that the law came through, the law was given by Moses, but truth and grace came by Jesus Christ. See, the law was given through the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. It was given through Moses, through angels, but actually grace came in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the grace of God. He is the truth of God. He came to have a relationship with you. You can't have a relationship with two cold pieces of stone, but you can't have a relationship with the person Jesus. So that's the difference between religion and a true relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ wants to have a relationship with you. Look at Romans 2, look at, look at verse 21. It says, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? And so here we have uh, religious people love to teach. They put themselves in the seat of a teacher. They, they love to teach others. And so Jam the book of James actually says not many of you should strive to be teachers because you're going to have a stricter judgment. And so when you get up to teach, people are going to judge you uh, on what you do when you get outside the pulpit, outside of the teaching. People are going to have a strict judgment upon you. And so, again, it's, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be just call yourself a teacher. You need to be called to teach. And so, again, not many should be teachers, the ones that God called to be a teacher. But religious people love to teach other people. And their God haven't called them to do it. And they do it in a very critical way. They do it with hatred. They do it with a... With a, with a uh, uh, a negative bent to it and so again God wants us to teach with the love of God and so those who are legalistic love to take the role of a teacher and they and they endeavor to take the place of the Holy Spirit and so you know the, as a minister of the Word of God you should be ministering the Word of God and what is the Word of God the written Word of God is the principles of the Word of God and so every area of life you can find a principle a general principle that will guide you in life but what is between the general principles of the Word of God? That's the specifics in your personal life. Like the Word of God says that you shall work. If you like to eat, you should work. That's why I work. <laughs> if you, if you, if you want to work, but you know what? That's the general principle of the will of God for all people. But the specific will of God is where to work. Where should you work? Because there's no scripture that says thou shalt work at Walmart. Now, it may be in the book of Hesitations. I don't know. <laughs> But that is a, that's in the, what fills in the blanks between the general principles of the Word of God, that's the Holy Spirit in the heart of each believer. But you know what a religious person will? They start taking the role of the Holy Spirit. Not only are they teaching the general principles, but they're teaching their own uh, personal uh, scruples on how that looks in your life. They'll tell you that you can't watch this movie, you can't go to this place, you can't go here, you can't go there, and they start filling in and trying to be the Holy Spirit for you. And so again, don't let anybody be the Holy Spirit for you. So the teacher and preacher of the Word of God teaches the general principles of the Word, but the Holy Spirit fills in the blanks. And so again, they try to fill in the blanks of the general principles of the Word, and the Lord calls those who are teachers um, but we are not to be the Holy Spirit. And here it says, if you teach someone certain things, are you not teaching yourself? Because legalism will inevitably lead to hypocrisy. What's hypocrisy? It's telling you someone to do something, but you don't do it. Matter of fact, you do the opposite. Hypocrisy is saying one thing, but doing something else. And so a legalist will preach real heavy on living holy. They'll preach it, live holy, live holy, live holy, but on the inside, secretly, they're not living it themselves. And so, again, they're hiding it. So legalists, legalists live a secret with secret sins, and they appear to be holy, but they're living a double life. And then it will come out at some point. And so some legalists, such as Saul of Tarsus, lived an outwardly holy life. People could look at his outward life and couldn't find a problem. But what the problem was, he was filled with sin on the inside, filled with jealousy and covetousness and pride. And so Saul of Tarsus said, I am the chief of sinners. And so he was the most proud human being there was. And so again, some legalists such as Saul of Tarsus are able to outwardly live a clean life, but inwardly they're filled with sin. Jesus says... 
And he spoke to the Pharisees of his day. He says, you know what? You clean the outside of the cup, but the inside's a mess. You clean the inside, the outside will become clean. Look in Matthew 23. I want you to see what Jesus said about that. Matthew 23, look at verse 25. Jesus said, woe to you. I don't want Jesus to say that to me. That's not a good day. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup. It's real shiny, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside may be clean also. And, when, and, and the only way you're going to clean your heart is come to Jesus. The blood of Jesus is going to cleanse your heart. You'll be justified, be born again, brand new on the inside. And then out when you renew your mind, then your outward life will become cleansed. But it has to start from the inside out. And so again, religious people are always starting from the outside trying, trying to be in, trying to change their actions to become righteous inside. And so it's the opposite. And so next it says, first he says that you teach another do you not teach yourself and then he says you who preach that a man should not steal do you steal here we find that they start out instructing then they move to teaching and then they go to preaching what's the saying legalism will lead to greater and greater hypocrisy legalists will go from instructing and teaching to then preaching as their personal life becomes less and less of what they teach they start to preach to others loudly on living holy They just get louder and louder. They do this in order to soothe their own conscience that's telling them that they're not doing it themselves. They try to drown it out by yelling and preaching loudly to others what they ought to be doing. So it's interesting that those who are the most legalistic are the loudest preachers. Those who scream their messages usually are the most legalistic. Legalism and legalistic preachers rely on the flesh, fear, and intimidation. Loud preaching is relied upon instead of the gentle, convincing power of the Holy Spirit. Pastor, minister, teacher, you don't have to preach loudly and try to get the people to see what you're saying. You just proclaim the word of God in gentleness and meekness and the love of God. The Holy Spirit will touch hearts. The Holy Spirit will break the hardest of hearts. And so again, most people don't like being yelled at. So they tune it out and they leave. We must rely on the deliver. We shouldn't rely on our delivery, but on the deliverer. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. So legalists here, there, it says that you preach that a man should not steal. Do you steal? And so legalists are thieves. You know, Satan is the first thief. It says he's the the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus, Satan is the first thief. What how what was he what was he trying to steal? God's glory. He was trying to put attention on himself. He's trying to glorify himself. And he actually was stealing glory from God to give it to himself. Legalists are thieves. Satan was the author of it. And the legalists will try to rob glory away from God and take it for themselves. They boast in their performance and their ability. And therefore they take the glory and credit that only belongs to God and to Christ. Robbing God is a greater sin than robbing man. They wouldn't go rob the 7-Eleven, but they don't mind robbing God of his glory. And so look at Romans 2.22, and this is the religious person again. You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You abhor idols, do you rob temples? And so again, uh, Jesus actually said, if you lust after someone in in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. And so the Pharisees in Jesus' day were guilty of adultery. Not only spiritually, but naturally, they were doing it secretly. How do you know, how do I know that the Pharisees were doing this? Because when, remember the woman caught in adultery, caught in the act? Well, she was caught in the act with someone. And so how did the Pharisees know about it? It was happening in secret. They were hiding out. This thing was set up. But one of them went in there, was sleeping with her, and they all hopped in and caught them. And so, again, we don't ever talk about the man that was caught in it. We just talk about the woman caught in it. But how do we know the Pharisees were guilty of it? Because, remember, Jesus went down there questioning, should we stone this woman or should we let her go, trying to catch him? He reached down and he was riding in the, in the earth and the ground. And so then he rose up and he says, those without sin. Actually, the Greek says, without, those that are without this sin. Those without the sin of adultery cast the first stone. And what happened, it said they started to leave from the oldest to the youngest because the oldest knew their guilt. So the Pharisees in Jesus' day were guilty of adultery. And so again, 
And then he says, do you abhor idols? Do you rob temples? The Jews in the early history had a love affair with idols, with stones and with metal and with wood. They would, burn, they would bow down and worship idols. And actually, they were cast out and went to Babylon because of it. But when they came back, they threw the physical idols out of the way, and then they had spiritual idols. An idol is not just a natural piece of wood or stone. It's anything you worship more than God. Money possessions, people, position, fame, and even yourself can become an idol. And the Jews were known throughout the ancient world to plunder heathen temples and make financial gain from the booty from these temples. Matter of fact, you know that the ancient world, the temples were the banks of the ancient day. And that's where the money was stored. And so these Gentile, these Jews would look down to the Gentiles and say, the unclean, we shouldn't have anything to do with them. But they were running business deals with the banks and the temples of the day. They were actually in there taking the money, trying to make interest and use that money for their own advantage. And so they were actually robbing these temples and they were making finances or money their God. And so they were guilty of, of idolatry. Romans 2.23 it says, you who boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Legalists are filled with boasting. They boast in the law. They're always speaking of God's holiness and our need to, to upkeep his holiness. They proclaim that we need to keep the law, but they only really boast in the part of the law that they can keep. They don't boast in the entire law, just the top ones that they can keep or they think is important. And and they end up, they really boast in themselves, and they don't boast in the law, they boast in themselves. And it says, do you dishonor God through breaking it? It's not what you do that honors, it's not what you say that so much honor God, it's what you do that honors God. And it says, by breaking the law, you're actually dishonoring God. I don't care how much you say you honor God, but your actions dishonor God. As a Christian, you can go and you have a bumper sticker and you say, praise Jesus, and you can have a wonderful church service and you go out and then you live a life that's double, that's not according to the word. You live in the flesh, you live a carnal life, and people around you are watching. You don't think people are, but people are. People are watching. And you actually are bringing dishonor to God by your lifestyle. Look at verse 24. Matter of fact, it says, you Jewish religious people, the name of God is actually being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And so again, the Gentiles could, would hear the Jews preach holiness and God's law and how much they were more holy than the Gentiles. But then they would observe the Jews lie, steal, cheat, fight, murder, and then they would blaspheme God. No, and that happens every day. You'd see, you know, people proclaim, I'm a Christian, you know, and they'll share, you know, they'll share Jesus while they're trying to work and they're not doing the work, but they're preaching. And so, and then, but then they, the world will see them get out and they'll watch them be dishonest, not being, not being good at work. They'll see them dishonoring their parents, lying, stealing, cursing, uh, sexual sin, adultery, divorce, and deeds that they themselves wouldn't do. They'll see it in Christians. And then they'll say, you know what, I don't want, if that's Jesus, if that's like Jesus, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. And so again, we don't want the world to blaspheme God because of our lifestyle. Look at Romans 2, look at verse 25. It says, For the circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So in the times of Paul, Christian legalists were telling the Galatian church that, that to please God and to be right with God, you had to be circumcised. They just picked one little part of the law, circumcision, and left everything out and says, as long as you're circumcised, you're good. And why did they pick that? Because what circumcision is done once and for all. Once that's done, you don't have to do anything else afterwards. And a lot of the Jews are saying all that you really need is to be circumcised and then you're good. It doesn't matter what you do after, because that's a, you're in covenant if you have that circumcision and it doesn't matter what you do. There's a lot of Christians like that. Well, if you just have Jesus and you're in covenant with God, it, has no, it doesn't matter what you do. Now, vertically with God, we are in covenant through the blood of Jesus, but horizontally, it matters what you do because people are watching you. And so your lifestyle is a billboard for Jesus. But what kind of billboard are you? Are you a billboard that attracts people or detracts them? And, put, you know, I heard Gandhi actually went to church one day and they threw him out because he, he, he wasn't lined up with what they thought a Christian would be. And he was just wanting Christ. He, he loved the teachings of Jesus. He, wanted, he was attracted by Jesus. And he went to a church and met Christians. He says, you know what, I would have been a Christian one day, but I, I would have been a Christian, but I met one. 
Now, he can't stand, no, God, he's not going to stand before God and be uh, without guilt because, you know what, if you let a hypocrite stand between you and God, then the hypocrite's closer than you are. And so, again, don't let hypocrisy stand in the way of you in a relationship with God. But, guys, it's important how we live because there's people watching. We are to share the gospel with other people. So Paul said that circumcision would not profit you if you didn't keep the entire law. That means the law, you can't pick certain things in the law you like. You can't pick your top, your top 10 that you like. Now the law was 613 commands, and it was one unit. If you broke one, you broke the entire thing. It was like a plate of glass. You put a BB through a corner of it, it's ruined. You need to change it out because it's broken. And so that's the way the law is. It was a unit of 613 commandments. And so you broke one, and so like you broke the entire thing. And so again, holiness is profitable towards God only if you have a perfect holiness. And so you can't pick and choose what to be holy in and what not to be holy in. God's holy standard is 100% perfection, and only one man's done that. His name is Jesus. When you accept him as Lord and Savior, his righteousness now becomes your righteousness, and now you have a standing before God on a perfect righteousness. So we become holy by faith, not by our outward observance of rules, because, we're again, we're not perfect in our, our behavior. Look in the book of Acts. Acts 26, look at verse 18. This is how we, we become holy, truly holy in God's eyes. Acts 26, look at verse 18, says that Paul's call was to open the eyes of the Gentiles in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That word sanctified is a word that means to be made holy, to be made holy. And we are made holy, not by our actions, not by our trying to observe the law, but we are made holy by faith that's in Jesus. When you put your faith in Jesus, his holiness becomes your holiness. And so Jesus actually becomes, comes on the inside of you, and so he's your life source, and out from trusting Jesus on the inside, he will bear his fruit in your life. He's the vine, you're the branches. As you trust in the vine, he manifests that holiness from the inside out. It's not from the outside in. And so, but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So again, if you break the law in any degree, you're, you're guilty of sin and you're a sinner. So no Jew except Jesus kept the entire law. And so that means that both Gentile and Jew, none of them kept the law. Therefore, both of them needed to be saved. Let me say this. An unsaved Jew is no better off than an unsaved Gentile. You know, there's many today that believe the Jews have a different covenant with God and they don't need to receive Jesus. And so that's not the case because it says there's only one name given among men under heaven which we must be saved but Jesus Christ. That's Acts 4.12. And so again, why would Paul go to the Jews to be beaten and hit with stones and stuff preaching the gospel if the Jews didn't need Jesus? And so again, an unsaved Jew is no better off than an unsaved Gentile. And so the uncircumcised were considered the heathen that had no covenant with God, no hope, and, and, and had no God in the world. That's Ephesians 2.12. And so the Gentiles looked down, the, were looked down upon. And actually the Gentiles were called the sinners of the Gentiles. But you know what? The Jews, if you don't keep the law, you become the sinners of the Jews. Both are sinful. Both are sinners by nature and both need Jesus. Let's go to verse 26. Romans 2.26 says, Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? What does this mean? This means that if a Gentile gets saved, gets born again, and puts his faith in Jesus, then that righteousness of Jesus becomes his righteousness. And, so, and then when a Gentile, born-again believer, starts walking in the love of God, living the branch, manifesting Jesus the vine on the inside of him, then he can actually fulfill the requirements of the law because Jesus says that the love of God, walking in the love towards God and towards man, fulfills the law. How do we fulfill the law today? Love the love of God. We don't feel in our own energy, our own strength, but we tap into the love of God that's been shed abroad in our heart through the new birth, and we allow God to love through us, then we, can, then we fulfill the law when we walk in love. Because when you walk in love, you're not, you're not going to lie against someone, you're not going to kill somebody, you're not going to commit adultery against that person. Anytime you sin is a step out of the love of God. But if you know the love of God, receiving the love of God, walking in the love of God, you're going to walk naturally, by, more by accident, you're going to fulfill the law by walking in God's love. 
And so the only way a Jew or Gentile can keep the righteous requirements of the law is be born again by faith in Jesus, and then again walk in his love. And so look at verse 27. Romans 2, look at verse 27. It says, Will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision uh, are a transgressor of the law? And so basically he's saying that if a Gentile gets saved, even though he's not physically circumcised, and he's walking out the love of God, fulfilling the requirements of the law, then actually he's closer to God than you that has circumcision. That's breaking the law. And so look at verse 28. It says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Now this would get Paul in big trouble here. This would just give a heart attack to the Jews. Because the Jews thought, well, I am born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm a natural Jew. I have circumcision. I'm a Jew. You're a nasty Gentile. And God says, no, what is a Jew? A Jew is someone that actually trusts God, believes in the Messiah, trusts in him as a follower of God. And so a, a Jew is not one that's just outwardly in the flesh. It says, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is in the outward in the flesh. Jesus told the religious Jews of his day that he could raise up natural descendants of Abraham from rocks. So there's these stones over here, I can raise up descendants of Abraham. Now, I don't know how that would be possible, but if Jesus said so, he could do it. Next of all, as Abraham was saved by faith, he became the first Jew. There weren't Jews before Abraham. Abraham got saved by faith as a Gentile and became the first Jew. What's a Jew? One who believes in God by faith. And so there are some who preach a dual covenant. They say the natural Jews are all saved because they're descendants of Abraham. This is not the case. A natural Jew that rejects Christ will spend eternity in hell just like a Gentile does that rejects Jesus. There is no name under heaven by which we must be saved than Jesus Christ. That's Acts 4.12. And actually, when you get saved, you become a spiritual Jew. That's good news because Jews are blessed. You're blessed. You know, you're the, the blessing of Abraham's on you. Now, well, I don't see it. I don't feel it. Well, because you've got to believe it. It's, it, it. it's activated by faith and it's voice activated. The blessing of Abraham is, is, is faith activated and voice activated. You've got to believe it before you feel it, see it, or experience it in the natural. You say, you know what? I am the seed of Abraham because Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham, but I accepted Jesus. I'm inside Jesus. Jesus is inside me. I'm one with him. Now I become the seed of Abraham. And so the blessing of Abraham is upon me. Every blessing Abraham had, both natural and spiritual, belongs to you. You don't mean not know it, but you need to say, I'm blessed. Say out there, I am blessed with the blessing of Abraham. You're so blessed you don't even know it. Bless God. You've got to know it. You've got to believe it. You've got to speak it over your life. You'll see it manifest. Actually, the church is spiritual Israel. We saw that last week, and I believe it was in Romans 9, where it said, um, or a, 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 yeah, I think it was Romans 9 or 10 out there. It says that the, not all of Israel is Israel. It's those that have faith in the Messiah that's born again, that believes in the Messiah. And so the church is spiritual Israel. I want you to see that. You're spiritual Israel. Now, there's a natural Israel. I'm not saying the church replaces natural Israel, but you're spiritual Israel. You're the believers. Look in Galatians 6.16. This is Paul. Paul says, as many as walk according to this rule, this is trusting Jesus, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. You know what? The church is the Israel of God. Next, you are part of spiritual Zion. Zion in the Old Testament was a, was a picture of Jerusalem and of the people of God. So your spiritual Zion, look at Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 22. Hebrews 12, look at verse 22. It says, but you, say, say me. I have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, the God of judge of all, to all spirits of just men made perfect. See, you're part of spiritual Zion, but you're also called the heavenly Jerusalem. You're the spiritual Jerusalem. The church is the spiritual Jerusalem. Look in Revelation 21, verse 9. You are spiritual Jerusalem. Revelation 21, verse 9 says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride. Who's the bride? The church. I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. 
And he carried me away to the, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. You are lively stones built up in him. He's the cornerstone and you're the lively, the living stones and you're spiritual Jerusalem. You're the heavenly Zion. You are the um, Israel of God. And so it says the believing Gentiles are, gra- actually believing Gentiles are grafted into the spiritual tree of Israel. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 17. We're coming to the end here. Romans 11, look at verse 17. You're actually grafted into spiritual Israel. Romans 11, look at verse 17. Paul says, and if some of the branches were broken off, that's the religious Jews that didn't believe in the Messiah, rejected Jesus, they were broken off. And you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them, that's the believing Jews, have become a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. And so the olive tree is spiritual Israel. And so you've been grafted in when you're born again, and you are part of that covenant. As much as a believing Jew, you're just an equal heir to Abraham. And so look at verse 29. We'll end this. It says, but who is a Jew? This verse says, but he's a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And so Christianity is a byproduct of union with Christ in your spirit, your born-again spirit. By this union, the fruit of God is developed outwardly. Religion is about taping on plastic fruit. You ever met someone that's so fake? They just put plastic fruit over them. They look, they look like the fruit of the loom guy. Now, we're to bear true fruit, not plastic fruit. And so Jew, religious people, legalists, they just have plastic fruit. And so Christians are spiritual Jews because we're one inwardly in our spirit. Gnosis says the circumcision is of the heart in the spirit. And so, this, so what matters is a circumcision of the heart, not your physical body. And that's good news because we're going to find out the difference between natural circumcision and spiritual circumcision. There are some... There are some some things that are alike and some things are not alike. And so let's talk about physical circumcision and spiritual circumcision. Believers have had a spiritual circumcision of their heart. And we're going to find out what that it means in a second. Spiritual circumcision has some similarities and differences than spiritual circumcision. Let's talk about that. Circumcision was given by God as a sign of his covenant under the Old Testament law. But what's spiritual circumcision of the heart? It is also a sign of the covenant of God's people under the new covenant of grace. And so that's the same thing. It's a symbol of a covenant. And so one was in the flesh, a fleshly covenant. One's a spiritual covenant, the new covenant of grace. In the Old Testament, circumcision was done by humans. In the new covenant, no man does this. God does this circumcision himself. In the Old Testament, circumcision was in the flesh, the human body, but in the New, it's done in the spirit, in your born-again spirit. In the Old Testament, circumcision was only for men. This is how it's different. In the New Covenant, the spiritual circumcision is for all who believe, both men and women. And the women said, amen. Amen. (laughs) Praise God. You are equally in this covenant. In the Old Testament, circumcision was done by a knife physical knife in the new it's done by the sword of the spirit that will cut between spirit and soul so what happened when you got born again the word of god cut between your spirit and soul and it separated the word of god is the only thing the sword of the spirit is the only thing that can separate your soul from your spirit and so what happened is that your soul and body were cut away from your spirit and the spirit of god re caused regened you regenerated you caused you to be born again with the nature of god and then the holy spirit sealed your spirit from any contaminations that's what circumcision does it, it keeps you from contaminants and so when you have a spiritual circumcision it's to to keep Uh, protection against any contaminants you're sealed in your spirit so when you sin you sin in your soul and with your body but your spirit all along was saying don't do it don't do it don't do it and then you do it and your spirit says oh you did it that was not my nature that's not love that's not who I am and that's why you feel sick in the pit of your stomach because there's something on the inside saying that's not what I was born for I was born to be free not to be a slave and so again, when you sin, you don't sin in your spirit. Your, sin, your spirit cannot sin because the seed of God remains in it. That's 1 John 3, verse 7 and 9. 
So again, in the Old Testament, circumcision was done with a knife. In the New, it's done by the sword of the Spirit. In the Old Testament, circumcision was for natural protection in it, from infection and contaminants. In the New, it's for spiritual protection against pollution and spiritual infection. And notice it's done in the Spirit. And so when we're born again, the Holy Spirit seals our born-again spirit from any contaminants. And it says it's not in the letter. Outward observance of the command to circumcise was done on the eighth day. Matter of fact, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. You know what the eighth day represents? The eighth day was the end, was the beginning of a brand new week. It means newness of life. It means a brand new start. And so, but that's a spiritual sign. In the new birth, we're circumcised on the eighth day. What's the eighth day? It's a day that speaks of new beginnings. It starts with a new birth. So when you're saved, born again, you're circumcised, and it's the eighth day. It's a brand new day, a brand new life that you have. And it says, finally, whose praise is not for men, but from God. Legalists live for the praise of men. Jesus said that if you do things for the praise of men, that's all the reward you're going to get. But God will, will actually praise those. Who will God praise? God will only praise those that trust him because man has nothing else to offer God but to trust him. And even the faith we have, it came from God to start with. And so really, when we put our faith in Jesus, that's what receives praise from God. And so let's, let's end in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for the word of God. I thank you that you included us Gentiles into this covenant, that you brought us in, Lord, and you cleansed us from our sin, and you caused us to be born again and to circumcise us in our spirit so that we become a spiritual Jew. We become spiritual Israel. We become spiritual Jerusalem, spiritual Zion. Lord, I thank you that we have a covenant with you by faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And everything that's true of Jesus, he shares with us. His holiness, his righteousness, and his blessings comes upon us. So, Father, I thank you today that we are going to renew our mind to our covenant we have with you, that we are a spiritual Jew. And the blessing of Abraham is upon us. And we're not going to be moved by what we see, feel, or think. We're going to be moved by what we believe. And we're going to speak and activate this covenant by faith that we are blessed, Lord, we are a spiritual Jew, we're spiritual Israel, and the blessing of God is upon us right now. And we're, we're uh, anointed, and, and, and uh, we're anointed to prosper, Lord, in every area, spiritually, naturally, spiritually, physically, emotionally, uh, financially, every area we need it, that blessing's working in our lives. We speak it in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, we magnify you, and we truly boast in you and in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we worship you in the spirit. Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. I'll be back up and get ready for your communion elements, and then we'll also receive our offering. Amen, church. Let's celebrate that, that new covenant, that, that peace that we have with God because what he's done. Amen. We're going to celebrate God's freedom right now, and whether we're Jew or Gentile, we are all in that family of God now. Amen.
that out of our innermost being would flow rivers of living water. There's a mighty river flowing. There's a mighty river flowing in this place. It's a place of freedom, not a place of bondage. There's a mighty river flowing. There's a mighty river flowing in this place. Come on. 
There's a mighty river flowing. There's a mighty river flowing in this place. right now in the spirit how some of you are uh, dealing with fear just because of everything that's going on in our culture right now and I just see that river of life literally just washing it away it's like it's just going downstream just let that fear go right now is the perfect love of God just lets that go right downstream Hallelujah. No sickness, no disease, no fear, no bondage. Hallelujah. The river is here. The river is here. It's on the inside. It's on the inside. There's a mighty river flowing. Mighty river flowing in this place. Fill us up today with the Spirit. There's a mighty river flowing. There's a mighty river flowing in this place. What's in here? And it's full of passion, full of power, full of glory. It's full of grace. for the new covenant, Lord God. Hallelujah. And it's full of passion, full of power, full of glory. It's full of grace. Come on, let's declare it together. Mighty river, mighty river, fill this place. the mighty one. God, we recognize that this morning. As your body, as the body of Christ, you are the mighty one in the midst of us. You are the greater one. What's outside is not greater than what's inside. Even as we've been talking about this morning, God, out of our heart flow the issues of life. We thank you for your grace in this place. Hallelujah. And I just sense somebody's receiving a healing even now in your digestive system. Someone's receiving a healing right now. Come on, just open up your heart. Let that river flow out of your innermost being. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Your tongue will sing. Thank you, Lord, for your life. Thank you, Jesus. It's a 
mighty river. It's a mighty river. And it's full of passion. Full of power. Full of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's full of grace. You're worthy of it all. Yeah, come on, Joyce. You are worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all, Lord God.
deserves the glory when you understand grace you understand all the glory goes to the Lord none of the glory goes to you and your works but goes to the Lord and there was a word that was given forth by the spirit of grace a word of knowledge that someone's digestive system was healed so if that's you please email us at riverrockchurch.net at gmail.com let us know that was you love to hear that the blessing of Abraham, you know, one of the blessings of Abraham is divine health. Not just healing, but divine health. Do you know when Abraham was 100 years old, he, his body shut down? His reproductive system had shut down. It was said dead in the book of Romans. We'll get into that next chapter. And it says also the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was never, her womb never was open to start with. It was dead from birth. But the blessing of Abraham came upon them and life entered their bodies and started that reproductive system of Abraham and it opened up Sarah's womb and made it alive. 
and they had forth what was barren gave forth life and i speak by a prophetic word of god yes. there is someone out there or more that you've been barren you have not been able to produce children the blessing of abraham is resting upon you and he's opening what could not give birth there's going to be a lot of births we were laughing about it earlier before we started that around december and january there's going to be a whole lot of babies born because of the natural cause of this coronavirus and the quarantine. But I'm speaking to you, it's not because of a natural cause that you're going to have a child. It's going to be a spiritual cause. The blessing of Abraham is giving you fruitfulness. And then you know what? So much life was in Abraham's body after Sarah died. He got remarried to Keturah and had more children after that. I'm speaking prophetically. There's some there's someone or more that you think you're done with your childbearing days, that you're done with children, but God's going to say, no, he's going to surprise you. No, there's more yet to come. There's another one yet to come. Some of you out there are saying, Rick, please be quiet. <laughs> Perish the thought, Pastor. You need to be open what God has. and God, there's, there's someone out there, you're not done yet. There's, there's a, a child of promise that's coming. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for the supernatural anointing of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of Abraham is on your people. Those that have been spiritually barren, barren in their business, barren in their relationships, the life of God, the blessing of Abraham is touching those areas and quickening it, now giving forth fruit right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's, let's uh, honor the Lord with the first, first, first fruits of our offerings and the things that God's blessed us with. Let's bless God with our tithes and offerings. I think also God wants to bless, the blessing of Abraham was financial. Abraham was blessed in everything in the natural, with gold, silver, with donkeys and sheep and cattle and prosperity. God wants prosperity in your life. And the blessing of Abraham is upon you. And so we release that by believing that, releasing that God's our source. And so we're going to give an offering today. And so as we're, you're filling out your checks, you want to mail in, or you can go to the website, riverrockchurch.net, go to the giving link. And so while we're worshiping some more, you can go on there and do that and give, be part of this offering. But I just believe the blessing of Abraham is already on your life. It's not released when you give. It's already been released and that's going to, so when you understand that, then you're going to be a giver. And that's just going to be something that's going to be released in the natural because spiritually you're already blessed. You're already prosperous. You need to realize that. But it's released in the natural when we do something. And so give today, and I believe that blessing is released as you give. Let's, let's worship more, and I'll be back to pray for the offering, and then we'll have communion together. So get your communion elements, and we'll partake together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. of Jesus. He cleanses the inside and then the outside becomes clean as well. Right here we have what brings us to God. It's called communion. What brings us into relationship with God is not what we bring to the table. It's what Jesus brought to the table. He brought his body that was broken for us. He brought his blood that was shed for the remission of our sins so we can have righteousness. The night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. 
Through the broken body of Jesus, we have healing, divine health, and prosperity. All our natural needs are met. But the blood of Jesus, the same night after he had eaten and he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is the cup of the new covenant for for my blood shed for the remission of sins. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Through the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of all our sins, past, present, and future. It's the righteousness of God that we have a relationship with God. So let's partake together, put our faith in Jesus and what he did for us, that we have the blessing of Abraham because of this. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You might be saying, Pastor, I'm watching today. I don't even know how I got on this, and but I'm listening to this today, and I realize, I, I realize that I'm not right with God. I don't know Him like you say I know. I've been religious. I've been trying to go to do the church thing and the religious thing, but I, I realize today I don't really don't know Him. I've never accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. I've never been born again like you've talked about. Well, you can receive him today. Jesus loved you so much. He lived a perfect, sinless life for you. But he also went to the cross and he bore your sins on the cross. And he died for your sins. He shed his blood and died. He was buried for three days, three nights. And on the third day, God rose him physically from the dead. He's alive right now. He offers you the free gift of eternal life. He wants a relationship with you. Will you ask him into your life? Will you trust him as your Lord and your Savior? Will you let him forgive you and give you a new life? Cause you to be spiritually circumcised to be made new on the inside? Well, you simply do that by faith. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how you do that is by a believing prayer. If that's you, I want you to repeat after me from your heart because God's listening. Say, dear God, I'm a sinner. I need salvation. But I know I can't save myself. But I believe you sent Jesus, that he lived a perfect life for me. And I believe he died on the cross for my sins. And that he was buried. And he rose again from the dead. Lord Jesus, I confess you as Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Make me new on the inside. I commit my life to you, my eternity to you. I thank you that I am now saved because I accept you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've prayed that prayer, please email us at riverrockchurch.net at gmail.com. Love to know about it. Love to get you a Bible if you don't have one. The next steps on how you can grow. But if you've accepted Jesus, the Lord wants to impart a blessing. I'm going to speak the blessing of the Lord over you. It's voice activated. It's believing. So when we confess these things over you and speak those things over you, you got to believe it and you got to say amen. It's so. So lift up your hands. The Lord wants to bless you. Because you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and he kept every commandment God gave that you would have to keep to be right with him. He did it for you. And when you've accepted Jesus, that righteousness is now your righteousness. And now God speaks over you. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're blessed coming in. You're blessed coming out. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the field. No plague will come near your dwelling. No sickness attached to your body. No virus can touch your body and live. The enemy will come at you one way, but flee seven waves smitten before your face. No calamity will visit you or anything that belongs to you. Lord, I thank you for your covenant blessing over your people, the spiritual Israel of God, the heavenly Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, your people. Thank you, Father, for blessing them in a mighty way. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Guys, bless you until we see you next week. For my pardon. This I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus.
let's lift it up today. of Andrew Walmack. If that doesn't light your fire, I'm, I'm afraid your wood might be wet. So guys, thank you so much for joining with us, engaging with the message, connect groups. Thank you all for meeting together, fellowshipping together. We pray this blessed you today. And once again, we'd like to bless all the mothers out there. Thank you so much for what you do um, in, in season and out, whether it's a season like we're in or just daily life. And uh, just God bless you. Thank you so much for watching today. We love you guys. Hope to see you soon and catch you next week.